This is American Real, where we aim to inspire, empower, and enlighten you through the stories of our guests. Here's your host, Roger Brooks. You have curiosity beyond anything I've ever seen. Where does your curiosity come from? I mean, you, your curiosity is like is childlike, which is a great thing. I am a child. What it is, is I'm curious. I can't stop asking questions. Like I asked you, who's the statue on your left? You have no idea what you just told me about you. You know, I meet someone and all of a sudden, whoa, what's the lessons here? But I'm curious. If I find an artist, I can't get out of it. We've never met energy like him. He gets us like he's our age, but he's an elder. We believe in Stephen. You just let him know we're not doing anything until we have to. And they stayed with me. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Stephen Machat. You have been a worldwide entertainment attorney, music publisher, manager of music talent, and record label owner, as well as a film producer, among other commercial endeavors. Your clients have included the Electric Light Orchestra, Genesis, Peter Gabriel, Phil Collins, Phil Spector, Snoop Dogg, New Edition, Bobby Brown, and many, many more. You are the author of several books, including your latest, Unraveling the Bible, which we'll talk about today. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me on this glorious Saturday. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I would like to, uh, I would like for you to tell our listeners what you've been through over these past couple of months. You and I have had the opportunity to work together on your book. And in the process and right during the release, uh, you you had uh, uh, an episode happen, and, and I'd love for you to share some of that, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll try not to be too long, because we are in a minute, the clock. But I tried to fix my back, and I didn't want to have a back operation, because back operations don't work. Your body works off gravity, which we'll learn in my books, and we'll bring it back down to where it once was. So I found the doctor, or Debbie, my wife, found the doctor, who works with the uh, football clubs. And he fixes their back so they can get back before they're told they can get back. I'm like, oh, I like that. So I met the guy and he seemed good. I mean, he was pure rock and roller. He's walking around like he's, um, oh, the guy that wrote Leaving uh, Loathing and Leaving Las Vegas. You know, he's like one of those characters and he comes in and he's with this blonde babe and they come to meet me. And he sat down and we spoke. And we spoke about metaphysics. We spoke about the bodies and how your body works. Your body works off energy. You are not your body. You are not your body. And it's so hard for any of us to understand that. And our body works in a circular motion. But we're raised to believe in a linear motion. Like today is whatever it is, April 22nd. You know, well, so what? It's going to come again. Everything comes again. So anyway, going back to what I told you. So I agree to let the guy do my back. We do my back on January 6th. I wake up about 45, 50 minutes later, and he told me, this is perfect. No problem. Perfect, perfect. perfect. I'm like, whoa, great. Anyway, he says, be careful when you work. I got up, and I'm like, okay. But I was good. So January 6th was a Friday, January 13th. I'm walking a couple miles a day again with no pain. Then January 20th, then January 27th. So I got a month in and I decided I'm going back and here's my business. I'm going back to Cuba because I made an album during 2017 with the Buena Vista Social Club Orchestra. Because most of the singers were dead. This is huge stuff. This is a replay. It, it would make a great Broadway play. It, it's fantastic. You, I, bingo, I bring you back to Cuba. And again, I've made albums in over a hundred nations. I meet people. I learn people. I want to know why you do the things you do. And it's not the temptation singing to you. So anyway, I go back to get my music and I get down there and it's, I guess it's uh, Thursday. So Thursday, I get down there and I go to have my favorite daiquiri. I love their daiquiri with their rum and the way they make it like a snow cone. I'm like, all right, let's do this. I'm there. And then I go to my guy. My guy is an ex-Cuban general who works for the, um, he's my private eye. He's my guy. Because so, I've been in Cuba a lot. 
And when I ran for the United States Senate, I ended up fighting with everybody because I do not believe it behooves a Christian nation to starve your neighbor because you don't like their government or you don't like the fact they won't join the IMF, International Monetary Fund. So I get there, we have the drink, and then I walk down this spiral staircase, right? And as I'm walking down it, I feel something in my back. I'm like, I don't like that. And I, and my guy, the generals, he saw me come down a little bit off. And he looks at me and goes, are you okay? And I have a male ego. That's crazy. What do you mean, am I okay? You know, it's like, yeah, right? There's nothing I can't do. I, I, I don't have a cape you can see, but I'm Superman. So anyway, I, go, I continue. We go to the house. And then they're in there. And I have a man from the Cuban government. I got the two Cubans. We sit, we talk. I tell them what I'm going to do with their music. I'm going to put it out. I'm going to put them on a worldwide tour because I have big, big plans, not just the book that you and I did, you know, but I have five albums coming out. I've got two movies coming out. So anyway, I get downstairs, we hug, we talk, bop, bop, bop. Now they give me the music and everything. And they tell him to give it to my, his name's Angel, give it to Angel. I go to the bathroom and as I'm getting to the bathroom, my walking gets worse and I'm in the bathroom. And I'm having trouble, I'm a male, so I'm having trouble standing up and excreting. And I'm like, okay, I'll hold on to the sink, this and that. And then I go back into the main room and I hurry him up. I said, let's go, you know? So we do it and then he notices I can't walk down the front door stair and he helps me. And then I get into the taxi. And when this stuff happens to you, it's quick, you know? So I get into the taxi, they bring me back to the hotel. Again, they have the winding stairs but he, with foresight, got me to downstairs place. So I laid on the bed. Five o'clock became six. Six o'clock became seven. I can't move. So what they decide to do is leave me there. And let's see what happens in the morning. Maybe I pull the muscle. I didn't pull the muscle. But anyway, so he comes back in the morning. And he had three people stay there. You know, like they spent a few hours watching Mr. Michette. So they're watching me. And then he gets there at nine o'clock. And he goes, what can you do? I said, I can't even sit up. So he says to me, what are you going to do? I said, um, you tell me, let's go to the hospital. Well, okay. I said, what does well mean? Bring me over there. So we go there and we get in and we, we take an ambulance. So he tells me it's going to cost money. You know, I said, I don't care. Get the ambulance. How much? It goes to me $20. Seriously, right? I'm like, whatever. So we go there. They lay me down in the bed. It's like, okay. And the doctors look at me and they start touching me in my body spots and everything. Right. And I'm like, ow, 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 all this. And then they say to me, and the ramifications of this sentence are huge. They said, you've got to go back to the States. Mm. Now they didn't say that to me because they couldn't fix me there. They said it to me because I didn't want to hear this part. They said, you're not well. It's going to take time if it could be fixed. So what I did is they got me to the airport. They gave me three shots and they separated by four hours. So say one o'clock, four o'clock and seven o'clock. I got on the airplane and I got home to Debbie and I came back and I really didn't get out of bed. Saturday was what came. Then Sunday, then Monday, she looks at me. She goes, we're going to the hospital. So we went to the hospital. And they didn't know what was wrong. They thought I had heart failure, kidney failure, this failure, that failure. And I'm like, I'm ready to die. And what they do is they do an op, they decide to get into my back because they saw that I had an abscess growing. And they got into my back and the abscess was growing right where this guy helped fix my disc. And the abscess is bacteria for a lack of a better word. And all I know is I wasn't really conscious but the doctor, I saw his notes afterwards, and he said in it, I don't think I'll ever see this man again. I don't think he'll survive. And he didn't know what to do when he saw me. And then I'll tell your audience something. I write books. I wrote books like, we've got to get out of this place. I wrote books about who you are, why you're that, who are you. You're an energy. You're a conscious energy. energy. You have awareness. That's the key. And so I truly believe, and it was sort of reaffirmed, because what happened is when they were getting into my back at that moment in time, I looked and around me, and I'm really musical, because as you said, I produce music. 
I looked around me and there was this like the old coal trains, right? But it was it was an energy. And energy is what talks. Whether we realize it or not, when I talk to you, I'm sending vibrations to you. You know how to read the vibrations. They taught you how to be a computer in your body. Okay, I get, I, 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 that could be language. So what happened was I heard, as I saw it, I, it said to me, what do you want to do? I'm like, what do you mean, what do I want to do? I'm like, and I'm trying to communicate with it. it said, you could leave now and, and do what you write about in your book, Ascend. Or we weren't really, you know, you're still there. Why don't you, you want to finish your book? You want to finish your thing? Because this book that you did with me is the most important thing in my life. I explained to you who you are, why are you here, and where do you go next? And I've studied this. I'm ferocious with my studying. I can't take the word no for an answer. So I, I'm like looking, I'm like, oh, okay. But as I'm looking into the energy, I see the other side of the energy because, you know, the energy's there and through the clouds. I see Debbie. And I asked her when I came to consciousness a couple of weeks later, because I told her this story, she was exactly where I saw her. And she was with a friend and they were crying. They told her they don't know what's going on. They, they don't know. What ended up happening was, here I am, I'm still alive, I'm healing. You know, when I first spoke to you after the accident, I didn't know where I was. I could have been sitting up on Pluto. So uh, what happened was I came back and I'm gonna finish my mission. And Roger, you're gonna help me with my mission. And people who are listening to this, you're gonna hear my new music because I'm not making music for old people. And the most important thing my mother ever did for me she said to me, Stephen, listen to this song. She was in love with Frank Sinatra. My dad represented Frank Sinatra's people. And I'm, I'm figuring she's going to take me flying to the moon, right? And she had me listen to a song, a song called Young at Heart. And if you hear Young at Heart, as long as you stay young at heart, yes, your heart doesn't age. Aging is a graceful opportunity you get. You get to experience physical life as as a spring, summer, autumn, and fall. And that's fantastic. And then what we do is we teach you, okay, you're dead, okay, go, go to the church, go to the temple, be buried here, put those symbols on you. They put those symbols there on you so you reincarnate back into that form. If you study the Dalai Lama, who is not what we think he is, but it was the way that a country kept control by having their religious zealot be reincarnated so they would show you they bring the child around that is part of the families that they like. It's, you know what this is? And if, if the child who's crawling on the floor Googled to this, ah, he remembers. It's always a he. And um, I've, I've had the opportunity of meeting with the Dalai Lama. I met his oracles, which were hysterical. You know, I did one meeting with him because we were going to go eat dinner. <laughs> I just spent three and a half hours with them. I didn't know what to do. They were doing this. <laughs> And I'm like, what is this? And I was getting impatient. And anyway, I sat on my hands. So um, I came back and I want to finish what I started. I've got really good music coming. And what fascinated me, because two of the acts I didn't sign, one of them is called Kid, K-I-D-A-U-R-A. -A, and he takes after the music that I did with my son. We call it Hippos and Tanks. And it's rap trap, trap music. And they're... They're from London and Amsterdam, right? The two nations that ruled New York, named after King James <laughs> of York, right? But anyway, um, I, I believe this will be huge because with my son, we had Grimes, we had Arker, we had good music and we had Young Lean, which killed my son. Did they kill, kill my son? No, but their energy, Barry got caught up in their, their tornado and it's like, it, it just disappeared. And I got really mad at them for putting Baron into that tornado when I told them not to. It was a tornado of drugs and abuse and wildness. Barons didn't go to camp like maybe you did, like I did. You go to camp, you learn how to be a kid, and then you learn how to control kids. Yeah. And we're all kids. You know, so I lost my son. But so in his honor, I'm re-releasing the name Hippos and Tanks. We had three, we had a lot of big acts. And I got to take my son to 26 nations where I sat there with him, 
you know, and uh, <laughs> I'm that type of father, I'm a matchmaker. I kept picking up girls for them and he would get mad at me. But we were all over Europe and Brazil. I, I was in 21 nations in Europe with him. Well, look, we were in Brazil. wonderful you had an opportunity to do that. Not, not yeah. many father sons have that bonding opportunity. So I'm sure the time that you had was, uh, was just wonderful. It was fantastic. Yeah. I climbed the pyramids with him. Wow. I hired private tour of the pyramids. I get into the middle of crap. So I got guys that used to work for the KGB and they worked for the CIA. So they became my tour guides, taking us all through Cuba for those three weeks. I wanted to learn the energies. And all I understood was they gave me placeholders to come back and learn the energies, which is how I wrote this book in part. And yeah. And here I am with you all now and everyone listening. All I want to do is if you don't want, if you think this book is out to lunch, well, then it's the best science fiction book you'll ever read. But you're going to learn that a lot of the stuff they tell you science fiction comes from that. And as you pulled out of me, I worked with Stan Lee. I talked to him about this stuff. The Anakis and the film, all of them. But anyway, let's get into that. And I'll, I'll stop. There's my intro. My first question how how did you decide to write this? Because you have a series, um, you know the, the the Earth series. What what made you do it? What made you and I, uh, uh, you know, and how did we get here? If we if we kind of start here and go backwards. Okay, what happened was when I was a boy, my dad, who was an entertainment lawyer and then became a manager, he dealt with black people, and in the United States of racism, that's like, hey, wait a minute. So dad would have his clients come to my house. Now, I'm, I'm a kid. I'm five, six years old. I meet a guy named Clyde Otis. He's from Vicksburg. Okay. I asked him, what's Vicksburg? But I asked him when I woke up from a dream. And he was playing cards with my mother and father. And his date that night was Aretha Franklin, who taught me how to play poker without kidding around. And they were fascinated. I asked him that. Dad used to work. He was the business manager for Sugar Ray Robinson. I love Sugar Ray Robinson. Are you kidding me? He would come to the house and I'm answering your question. And he'd go, come on, Stevie. I go, what are we doing? And I lived in a place called Roslyn, Roslyn, New York, in Long Island. It's the North Shore. And they have hills. So he would run the hills and I'd ride my bike. I'm telling you now, I'm, I'm eight years old, nine years old. He would run next to me and he would give me his lectures. He said, don't live in the white Christian world. There's more to it. Take care of your body. Understand you're living in your body. He would tell me stuff like that. Your temple is your body. You don't need their temples. And I'm like, whoa. And then with him came um, Sam Cooke, who I loved. You know, and I, you could buy my book, God's Gangsters in Honor, and they share these stories. And then I had James Brown, which was absolutely hysterical. It's 1964. The Beatles come out with their movie. And James Brown's there. It's Labor Day weekend. And he drives into the car uh, driveway and he looks, he goes, Marty, I'm borrowing Steven. Okay, where are we going? Next thing I know, I'm in his car and I'm, I'm thinking I'm as cool as cool to be, right? And we go to the one stop and he has me take the singles out of his back and bring it into the front office where they're counting them. And singles in those days were 99 cents in retail. So he was selling them for 29 cents a pop because they could buy it for 49 cents. In essence, James Brown was bootlegging himself. So anyway, from there, I just, my whole life, I've studied history. I know history like few people do. I wrote this book called The Highways of Man. This book, is, it's 1.6 million words. It's a study of Earthlings' life in imperial religions and imperial governments. I just couldn't let it go. And well, I did me, it in anyway. Let me stop you for a second, because I'm yeah. sure people will be thinking the same question I have. Where where does the content come from? How do you write 1.6 million words? I study history. OK, what does that mean? We all do. But I live it. I go to these places. So when I'm looking at the king of Spain, what do you mean king of Spain? That started when Francis and uh, whatever her name was, Isabel, joined together being sanctioned by the Vatican, you know? Where did all these kings come from? What's the Holy Roman Empire? I've spent my whole life trying to decide, dissect what went on. 
you know, you go to, you study England and you, this is important. So you got English history, French history, and then European history. Okay. English history is a monarch who ruled the country with the Lords in association with the Lords. He was not an absolute ruler. France was an absolute ruler. Germany or the German subjects, which includes Spain, included Italy, in conjunction with the uh, Catholic Church, with them overseeing it and telling you what God wants, they created a Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't holy, wasn't Roman, and wasn't an empire. These, sit, these little localities would vote each other in, and they'd go to war, and they'd kill each other. You know, They would sanctify and glorify those who win in the holy name. They would crucify and just destroy those in the human frame that disagreed with them. So I, after I wrote that book, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was living in England, producing music. And I woke up and said, I need to go back to America. I need to fix our constitution. Now, by the way, saying that, we're the only country in the world that was created by the people. All the other countries in the world were created by something. And it's created by this. All of them. And therefore, since we were created by people from all those other countries, we were created by them too. When the United States went on its mission to remake nations after World War II, not one of them got our constitution with an executive branch, a branch, a legislative branch, not one of them, and a judicial branch, you know? And so I just kept researching and I go everywhere. I've been in India, I've been in Brazil, I've been all over Mexico. I had an indigenous Mexican record label. And I'm like, there's something here that we don't get. Because they tell you Mexican music, to me, was Hungarian music. You know, it's like, what is this? But then you get the indigenous people that made the noises from the elements in nature. And Roger, I dived right into it. And I realized, your listeners might like this, like Cinco de Mayo, the Mexican music that they play you, it comes from Emperor Maximilian who was put there by the Hungarian Australian Empire in case they needed to get into Texas, retake Texas in 1862, because the, the North put a blockade on all, all ships. They didn't want any ships coming to arm the Confederates. So they tried to invade us from the South. So in 1867, on May 5th, they got in there, they chopped the guy into pieces and it's called Cinco de Mayo. But answering your question, Watch, I go everywhere. I, I've been in Israel. I've given lectures in Israel. I tell them that there was never a disappear, disappear, whatever, D-I-A-S-O-P-R-A, disappear, yeah, from Israel. The Hebrews never left. That's bull. And they look at me and they go, oh, and they got really mad at me, a few of them there. I said, well, take out your smartphone, put in 162, 132 AD, Hebrews versus Romans. They do it. It comes up. That's the biggest, the biggest battle that they had against each other. I said, okay, I'm no smarter than you. I'm just aware and I ask questions and I've had more time. Can you tell me how all the, the Hebrews didn't leave in 70 AD? And they're like, uh, and then a couple of guys, yeah, this is a true story. I said, so what crap are you selling the world? Why do you let people say God threw you out of Israel? Why do you let people, why are you the victims? Why do you walk around with victimhood? What, what are you doing? And I also at that point started real, realizing that the word Jew is bull. It was the Roman way to say you, Y-E-W, use not pronounced. It was for Judea. Judea, the word J, you could look this up and I tell it to you in this book, which is really, really good book, Taking Jesus Off the Cross. I give you the history of the creation of all imperial governments and their religions. They added the letter J, they being the Catholic Church, into the vocabulary. They put it in, in somewhere around 1517. A J in Roman numerals or Arabic numerals was what you put after, like, say, you're writing 13. X and three I's, you put a J there to end it. So I just, I can't get out of it. I go somewhere, I want to know everything. I did a movie called Anaconda. <laughs> so I'm there in Anaconda and the embassy gets invaded, the Japanese embassy. And I'm just picking up the pieces, finishing the music. And then I'm told I have to leave the country. 
I'm staying in a hotel across the street from the Japanese embassy. I'm watching them start digging to get into the embassy, right? On the ground. So we had a move. They told me to go home. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. So I went on a mystical tour with my kids and my then wife. And I started studying the Incas. And it didn't teach me what I know now. But that door opened like Pandora's box. And I'm starting like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I told you earlier about Mexico. I've been all over Mexico. I'm like, hey, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then with Debbie, we got married in um, the Red Rocks of um, over there in Arizona. And I'm like, looking, why would they worship these Red Rocks? Where did this come from? How did they make it? I'm running around Egypt. Who, who blew up Mount Sinai? Who blew up the Sinai Peninsula? What is this? How did they make those pyramids? That's not how they made those pyramids. So after I lost the U.S. Senate race, I just really disappeared. I figured I have to finish why I came here. And maybe I'm not the person that will be elected to enlighten Americans and to stop hating each other and to stop telling people the Second Amendment gives me the right to get guns. Okay, Second Amendment was not by the creator. The, the front page says that we can own black people. The front page says women can't vote of the Constitution. They're not even smart enough to change the front page. They let you know that we were this racist, chauvinistic male society. And by the way, no woman, no cry. So what does that mean? If you don't have a woman, there's no baby crying because you just gave it birth. A woman is a man with a womb. So I've studied all religions, all my travel. I've studied the Hindu religions, the Jan religion, the Arabic religion which is a little bit different than the Iran religion, which I've studied too, the Shiites, a little bit different than the Sunni religion. And it's just like, this stuff is insane. It's insane. It came from somewhere. And everyone makes fun of the Bible, but I never did. Because everyone, uh, I'd say, what are you praying to? You're praying to a sky god? You're putting on a yarmulke and you think sky god's going to save you because you're holding your head in shame? You go to the Catholic or Christian churches, and what are they teaching you? It's cannibalism. You're eating flesh and drinking the blood, although it's symbolic. What, what is that? Your heroes on a, on a cross, dying of blood? It's like, what is this? You know, that's this book. I, I give it all to you. I did a movie, 1982, 83, 84, with Peter Gabriel, Last Temptation of Christ. And I did the music with Peter. But I got into the heads of the people that did it. And then I took their things live. I did a lot of movies where I get in with the music. And then because I'm the personality that I am, I end up taking it over and taking it over, taking it over. I mean, I'm your protector. I, I just, these people started getting mad at me because I kept questioning, what are you telling people? Who said that there were 12 disciples? The people that have this story. Maybe had different than disciples. Maybe there were different people. So I studied it. You know, I used to go to England all the time and I couldn't get out of Glastonbury. And I didn't know what Glastonbury was. So I've spent, you know, Glastonbury Music Fair and I'm well known in England. And I started studying it. And then I realized, oh, in Cornwall, they have uh, tin. Well, so what, Stephen? What do you mean, so what? If I marry tin, right, with copper, I get brass. Well, what does that mean? Well, they get the tin there. They got the brass elsewhere. And all of a sudden, I learned the exploration of the Atlantic and how they got into North America. Like in Lake Superior, there are deposits there, and they're going to deny it all they want. And they had a bigger native race there where they took the tin out. And then they sailed down the Mississippi River and what today's called Miami. They found, look it up, they found ancient civilization that dates back to about 3500 BC and was represented by the bull. And what's the bull? Well, the gods from Nibiru, they had astrological signs and they're in their sign of ruling earth. They was, those were their signs. And that sign represents uh, Nephil, right? Unli, E-N-L-I-L. Anyway, I love what I'm telling you. I could sit and talk all day with you. I, if I could just open your mind to the possibilities that there's so much more. If you believe in God, 
No, no, no. You're believing in love. So maybe love is God. Love is the energy that makes us all curious. Love is the energy. The answers are in the words that I use. You need a heart to live. Well, heart means art, right? It's in the word, right? If you look at all the planets where they got all their names, we're the only planet that is not a substance. We're Earth. In the middle of Earth is the word art. We're here to make art. We came here to do art, and we never get to do it. And I'm not going to stop singing my song. And even that injury that I had in February, and here I am, I'm walking again. I should be okay by the end of May. I don't want to push it because I need to start traveling. All I do is look forward to answering people's questions, getting them the books. I have the schoolofsacredknowledge.com. You can ask me questions. If I can help any of you, if I can encourage you to make music, to make art, to write books, to write poetry. I even worked with Leonard Cohen. You know, it's, it's insane what I've worked with. Snoop Dogg, right? It's, how does some, one person get all these artists? Well, you got to attract them somehow. I'm the honey. I attracted you. <laughs> it's like, here we are. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So look, Ask and me I question you all day. You, you, you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned your curiosity. You mentioned that you ask a lot of questions. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you today was, where does that come from? I, I mean, you have curiosity beyond anything I've ever seen, right? So you'll take it to the umph degree to understand it. And I don't think most people do because most people are actually lazy to take the time to learn. So, um, you know, you talked a little bit about your childhood. Uh, where where does your curiosity Come from. I mean, you, your curiosity is like is childlike, which is a great thing. I am a child. You know, it's a Buffalo Springfield song, but I am a child. And uh, what it is is, I'm curious. I can't stop asking questions. Like I asked you, who's the statue on your left? You have no idea what you just told me about you. You went there to experience Michelangelo in his home. You. That's all I need. And. You gave me what I need, my wisdom. I, okay, I get it. You went there to smell what he was doing when he did it. You know, and those were the Vatican cities. Like few people know that there was no Vatican in 1870. They closed it. They used to have Vatican cities where they used to kill people in the middle of the town square. Look it up, right? I do all this stuff. I worked with the church. I, would, I, I just can't stop. You know, I meet someone and all of a sudden, well, what's the lessons here? You know, I made music with Indians. I made music with the Dalai Lama, I told you. I had the biggest band in India whose father, Amjad Ali Khan. I, I spent months with him. I lived with an Arab. I was doing oil deals with her. She ran an oil leasing company, software leasing company. You know, and I, I lived with the fact that she had to come to grips with that I wasn't an Arab. What did she tell her friends? She said, well, you're not an Arab either. She goes, what do you mean? I said, an Arab is a Muslim. It's someone that lives in the Middle East, you know? A Muslim is someone that lives in a city, you know, lives in the desert, really, an Arab. And a Moor is someone that lives in grasslands. And then what they did is they divided into two different religions. It's just like the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Right. <laughs> and they excommunicated each other. And that's the war of Russia versus Ukraine right now. It's the Catholic Church. Versus the Eastern Orthodox Church. If listeners, if you think I'm kidding, look it up. That's the secret thing going on there. And I could go on and on and more and more. But I'm curious. If I find an artist, I can't get out of it. When I was in Cuba when I was running for the Senate. All of a sudden, I want to meet the Cuban people. And all of a sudden, I meet them. And all of a sudden, the government figures out, hey, we got something really good here. So they took me on a ride. They took me to every city. And they were holding unannounced concerts to be the new discovery. And that's fascinating. And I met the people. I met what they did. I learned their voodooism and all that nonsense. I learned about it. Like, if you're bored, look up so religion, S-O religion. That's the Santa Maria religion. And what they did is, it's, out, it's outrageous. And Peter Gabriel's album is called So. Hmm. And he was in Africa when he did it. So what am I telling you? But anyway, and I worked with Peter Gabriel. I, I, worked with, I worked with hundreds and hundreds of people. 
And you know, it was really interesting. When Debbie let the people know that I was, she didn't know if I'd make it and they didn't sign their contracts. My two groups, the ones that I really admire right now, a group called the Gulls uh -huh. and another one, Kid Aura, who's going to wear the banner of hippos and tanks. They both said to Debbie, they didn't know what to say other than, no, we've never met energy like him. He gets us like he's our age, but he's an elder. We believe in Stephen. You just let them know we're not doing anything until we have to. And they stayed with me. Wow. That's awesome. That's so, powerful. I'd love to get back to this a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Where did we come from? Why are we here on Earth? I know you touched on it a little bit, but break it down for the average person, if you can, to understand really where we came from, from, your, from all of your research and uh, how we got here. Okay. So I would start. You have to build a ballpark. It's that easy, right? So baseball is a square, right? Or it's a square. You can move it. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's a square if you really move it. So, okay, you got to create the playing field. When I say you got to do it, we're a consciousness that came from the beyond. We came out of the sun, an energy force that channels us. So what happens is we have energy and that sun's energy also creates physical things that will help you become what you can become. Okay, so we so, came out of the sun, and that created... Your consciousness came out of the sun. Our consciousness came out of the sun, which helps create, did you say, physical things? It does that, but it's two-part. A, it gave you the blood of curiosity. So if I want to get into it, that's the Holy Ghost. Okay. okay? Then you separate from that consciousness because you have a gravitational pull. You want something, you need something. That's gravity. You're not, you're not featherless, which is the Egyptian dead of Book of the Dead. You can't ascend as long as you have a want or need. You got to let go, which is the Indian religions. And I, I've studied all this. It's like outrageous. Okay, so now what happens? They've got to build a ballpark. They've got to make an outfield. Who's they? The unseen hand of creation. So their ballpark is called the solar system. So what do we do with the solar system? Well, we need the energy source, which we'll put in the middle. Okay, that energy source will make elements out of the ethers in the air, and it will start spilling off chemicals like Jupiter. Look at what Jupiter is. That's a laboratory. You know, there's no firm land in Jupiter, really. It's a masculine planet because all it has is basically sperm. Mars, Earth, those are female planets. They have wombs. You could grow stuff there. And we, I explain that in the book. And then you need these chemicals to make bodies, and the sun will put them together. Like I said to you earlier, with the uh, copper and the tin, who would ever think copper and tin would become the number one weapon to kill people? You know, brass, the brass revolution or whatever. So what happens is they build this world, they come here, and they've done it, they've done it forever since it existed. But in this book that I wrote with you, I couldn't get out of the tablets. I couldn't get out. So I spent, ever since I was a kid, one of my father's clients that worked with the kinks, he came to me, he goes, you ask questions here. And he gives me a book, and it's called The um, Flying Chariots. And at that time, it was 67 or 68. I, I confused them only because of our school years, September 67 into 68. So that year, I, I'm like, this is what I want to learn. I thought it was the most fantastic thing. I love the kinks. My dad was a lawyer. And I'm like, who wrote Waterloo Sunset? You know, a well-respected man, what a great song. Another guy who was around me at this time was Donovan. So I like girls. I flat out admit it, I do. You know, I respect them. I think they're the most beautiful objects on the earth, as long as they smile. But if their wants and their needs get too thin, you know, when they, they can't live with it, watch out. They will get you to do the most foolish things. Why? Because you need to impress them. Instead of you both living in peace and walking hand in hand on that road where you both are angels, that's all you are as a consciousness. So now you're walking down there and 
what are you really doing? Where are you going with all this? You know? So what happens is here on earth, in this book, I found these tablets. I couldn't get out of them because everyone believes in them. But no one's ever sat and put them together. And each thing, like you do something, I do something. It's the same source. So if I know what you're doing and I know what I'm doing, great. I just fixed the puzzle. So because of my mastery of history, I'll put that together. And it's metaphysical history. I study metaphysical history, which I get into and in how you live in this book. And it was voted one of the top books on the afterlife. I explained to you, you're an energy. You're going somewhere. I promise you, Stephen Michat had a choice. I'm not the only one, but I may be one of the only ones that understood what my choice was because they study it. And um, I came back, but you can ascend. And, the, and that's the Egyptian book of the dead. That's the uh, Hindu book of the dead. And they're not dissimilar. They were written by the same person. I know it. So I studied with the people that worked for the Dalai Lama. I studied, again, with the Coptic Christians, this and that. And I was able to piece it all together. And the guy that helped all of us piece it together. And there are people who have dedicated their whole lives to doing this. And there's a lot of books out. I've read them all. And then I decipher what's this and that. And I, I went to it. I went, no, I need to know what this is. So I explained to you in this book. And that's what I did with Stan Lee. There was once a planet called Tiamat. And there's another planet called Nibiru, which is further away from our sun. You know, and because I'm telling you there's eight or nine planets, you know, if they like Popeye, they would call Pluto a, a planet. But anyway, you got that. <laughs> all right. But Pluto's all gases and they think it came from Mars. Well, how did it get there? I don't know. So Tiamat circled between Mars and Jupiter. And what happened was this planet Nibiru, instead of going around like a merry-go-round, it went around like a sling. And when it came close to the Earth, each year anniversary for them is 3,600 Earth years. We live on Earth years. The sun lives on sun years. The sun takes 72,000 Earthling years to circle all the planets, which is, it's outrageous. And then if you're into math, put 365, multiply it by 17, no, multiply it by 365 multiplied by 72. And then, and, then, and then they had 18 years, 18 days. Plus 18? Yeah, those represent the leap year of each year. 26,298. All right, ready? Divide that by 12. So call it 2,200. Remember when they, remember they teach you Oh, right now we're in the age of Aquarius and we left the age of Pisces. That's 2,200 years. I didn't make that up. How would they know that? W what is this stuff? Where did it come from? You ever see the Mayan calendar? That's what it is, but no one wants to go there. How did they plot it all? The Nephilim, who are in the Bible, come from planet Nibiru. They were space travelers. They moved around <laughs> whatever, the solar system, maybe the galaxy. I mean, first you got a solar system. Okay, great. So we've got the state of New York where you are. Okay, what's in solar system? Well, we call it Earth, North America. So we make different solar systems that have things, but that's our galaxy. We're in the northern, we're in the western side of Earth. That's our living galaxy. Well, okay, Earth lives inside a galaxy as does our whole solar system. And there's millions and millions of us. And what I'm telling you now, NASA knows, like you helped me put on cover, the meteorite that they found, Opus 19, it's on the cover there. You know, and it was written in these tablets that were written 400,000 years ago. Yeah, and the Bible has their names. So what I did is I just, I really spent three years just putting together all my research. And after I wrote, we've got to get out of this place, which is book three, and taking Jesus off the cross book too. I went back and because I wrote this history of mankind, you know, and I went back and I said, I've got to write this book, Unraveling the Bible. 
because the Bibles were all our problems. Are. The Bibles are where civilization was created. They divided the civilization into different areas. You have one in the Indus River Valley. They, no one communicated with each other. And they made us human beings. They made us beings. They definitely did. The Bible's true. And I give it to you in the book. And argue all you want with me or whatever you want. Please do argue with me because we'll become better. It's the best science fiction story you'll ever read. Like if you go into um, South Africa and you look for the um, in Zimbabwe, look, look for the laboratories. They're, they're there. They're cages where they were making different animals. They were cloning animals. Like where Wait, does it? Hey, you're, you're talking beings from where? Nibiru. Nibiru. That came in the came to Earth. They got here about 400,000 years ago, and they came to Earth to get the gold. They knew Earth had gold in its veins because when the two planets, Tiamat, when Tiamat separated Earth, half of it became the Astro Belt, which rotates in the same space that Tiamat used to go. And occasionally they fall out. So they're going to land on Mars, the moon, or Earth. If they go to Jupiter, they'll get burnt right away. You know, they'll be changed and they'll become gas. And then it's called alchemy, right? Alchemy. A gas can become a liquid. A liquid can become a solid. That's what we live in. We live in a human laboratory. No, we live in a, a being's laboratory. That's all we are. We're alchemized, you know? It's like when you're dead, what do you do? Well, you'll be alchemized by the earthworms that will eat you. At the same time, you're not there anymore and you'll go pick your next spot. So anyway... Tiamat fell into a spot between Mars and Venus, and we call it Earth. And it adopted the Earth rotation, which is not circular, even though we make it circular, which goes on for 365.25 days every day. Okay, so we sit there, we live in a world where they tell you every day is 24 hours. Well, intellectually, it's not. <laughs> it's like, that's why we have a leap year, right? So, um, it's, it's just, I, I study this stuff. I can't get out of it. I'm like, where did you get this from? You got it from somewhere. Someone told it to you. You know, when I was with the Indians and I made music with the Native American Indians and you had to see my friends because I, I was king of music in 1992. And I woke up one day and I'm sitting there with this Indian. He goes, man, you've got to come understand the Indians and their way of life. Same with Dick. He's a friend of mine. So I did. And I put up five albums with him and the people back home in LA, I didn't want money. I wanted that. That's all I wanted. And I was doing world music. By the way, I started world music with Peter Gabriel. Seriously, I've been all over the world making music. You know, I've been in Uganda. I've been, I've been everywhere. I consider it a blessing and I'm on it. I've been in Iceland. I see how, what goes on there, you know, and I just, I want to learn more. So that's where, the Nephilim are written, N E F I L I M, and the way they change languages on you is through vowels. So I becomes E and I, I E I O U, you know, and there's no I in Spanish. And who did that? Well, it was deliberate. So, because that way you can't communicate with each other. But today we've got new toys. My machine can tell me what you're saying. Could I have written this book in the year 2000? No way. But I get there and I'm like, okay, Stephen. Let's go. Next airplane ride. Here we go. You know, and I would go there. You know, I, I climbed where Moses got the tablets. I climbed where he, where they broke the, I've got pictures of me doing this. You know, where they broke the tablets because he made it, he made it a, a bull, a ram. And the ram was the year of the rams. But it's all in that book. And Stan Lee used to read this stuff like I do. And he's older than me. And I ran a music company with him for making webisodes. And he and I would just sit there and we'd leave. His characters come from there. Like, what's Spider-Man? Well, what do you mean what's Spider-Man? It's a spider. You ever see what a spider does? A spider makes a nest. It pulls those lines there. And when I told you earlier about Baseball Park, you need to have all the elements get in there so you can lock it in a gravitational pull, right? And what's really scary is when we send our spaceships out, what we do, okay, spaceships go there. We bring back bacteria. This living bacteria on that spaceships. Where did we come from? Well, maybe we were a virus. What's a virus? A virus can get into your body. It's living. I fight with everyone. It's living. They tell you it's not living. They said it doesn't have a consciousness. What do you mean it doesn't have a consciousness? 
The minute it gets into your body, it'll go right to the DNA. It's right into the RNA and it will make a new, new order. Of course it is. You know, viruses, which is fungi, if you study fungi, fungi can erase all the ills in America, in, in our earth, you know? They eat plastic, to give you an example. I read all these books and I don't know why. I'm sitting with a scientist out of Cambridge and he and I became best friends and he gave me all his data on fungi. And I kept telling him that fungi is a virus. And he came back to me and he says, I think you're right. And how did, you know, I was going to go on British TV and they wouldn't let me. I was going to tell people in Britain that I'm exploring and working with this man there. And I believe virus, viruses land where they smell. They go to perfume. <laughs> they go to flowers. <laughs> and there's like, the English looked at me. We do, the English TV producer, we do not need you going on TV to say that we shouldn't wear perfume. I didn't say that, but whatever. But anyway, this book is divided into eight acts. And I give you the life of the film. And I wrote it from a diary. There's a diary in existence. You could read it. You could find it. They keep exploring. It's the diary of Enki, E-N-K-I. Enki was the, the son of Anu, who was king of Nibiru, who couldn't inherit the planet because Enki was not the bloodline when they, when they resolved the battle between North and South at the half. So they had to have the bloodline of this half and the body of the other. So they had the right one in An Li, whose son too. Enki is the scientist. Enki, in no uncertain terms, created mankind. He also engineered cows. Like you look at cows, that's not evolution. What animal could ever, how is a cow gonna protect itself from the wolves? It doesn't, mankind does. That's why there were shepherds, the sheep. And in the book, I give you, they wrote this, but it was from Enki's translations. And only because I understand history and I know where things moved and how they moved. And as they started getting out of, they lived in two areas. Originally, they lived in South Africa, which was their mining, because that's where they got the gold. And they lived in what we call the Middle East, really Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Israel, Yemen. There's, there's a dam there in Yemen that they built so they could navigate the Red Sea. I'm telling that to you. They tell you that in books. But oh, no, 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 no. That, that can't be. We're not aliens. We are aliens. Embrace it. Love it. You're more than you think you are. And when you get done playing on Earth, when you want to be drafted to another team of consciousness, go. Awesome. Or, or in the end, you could do what they teach you. When you're done... You go to absolute zero yeah. and you go back to the home of consciousness. My last sentence, you will never reach absolute zero. You can't shut off thought. You could slow it down. You can make it next to nothing. I'm going to try to slow it down as I watch the Yankees ball game after I leave you. But um, I have a full day of basketball today, too. But anyway, I'm seeing you smile. I, I, lo I love talking to you. I love your audience, wherever you are. Your smile is inside Roger's face, and I love you all. And listen to me. I'll say what I believe. I'll share my opinion with you. I'll listen to your opinion. But understand one thing. Your gift is life. It's called the present. Live it. Stop letting people take it away from you. Walk hand in hand with your neighbor. If you can, when you see someone, instead of smiling at them, tell them you love them. Tell them they look beautiful. Tell them something. That one smile can change their entire world, you know, and that's who I am. And by the way, I'm a pacifist, okay? But I'm a pacifist with a capital P and a capital F. I believe in peace, but I'll use my fist to get it because they will take it from you. Love it. Stephen Mashat, I didn't even have a chance to ask you all the questions I wanted to, so we're going to have to have you back. I really appreciate the time. Please get Stephen's book, Unraveling the Bible. It's available on Amazon. Uh, it'll be soon out on audiobook. But uh, it was a pleasure having you on today. And we're going to have to have you back again so we could talk about part two. I I'm on it. Or part three, too. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. Have a good th uh, Saturday. And thank take care. And bye-bye, listeners. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv. 
or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we can help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.